Dear Pastor, your voice is not audible. I think. Yeah. Put my mic down. Okay. Thank you, Prabhakar. Okay. All right. So welcome everyone. Sorry about the mic not being in its place. Um, all right. Let's pray and get started. Um, yeah. Uh, oh my. Maggie, would you like to pray? And then we'll get started, please. Okay, thank you, sir. Holy Father, we thank you for this morning. We pray, Father, that you open our hearts, open our minds, Lord, to understand uh, your word, the teaching we are going to receive this morning. As we learn the keys of supernatural, Lord, Quicken our spirit, Lord, so that we can grasp what, look, what you are going to teach us through past ashes. Empower past ashes. In your mighty name, Father, we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Ah, thank you. All right. So we, I think the first two hours, we're going to be doing uh, Christian apologetics. And Mangi, you prayed for the third hour. We're going to be doing uh, keys to supernatural ministry in the third hour, right? Um, oh, sorry, uh, I was dreaming keys. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that's all right. You prayed in advance. <laughs> that's okay. All right. Uh, so we uh, these first two hours are Christian apologetics, and um, we um, you know last. Uh, 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 last week, uh, we gave uh, um, three philosophical statements or reasons, and uh, one reason from a supernatural perspective or a spiritual perspective on why we believe that we believe in the existence of God. Why we believe God is there. And now we want to just uh, take this forward and kind of get into some time. Uh, we'll probably spend uh, uh, quite a few lectures on this, uh, on uh, looking at things from a scientific perspective. Right? Uh, and uh, so, what we will do uh, in, in this lecture today, uh, this first lecture, is we will just have a little, you know. Uh, talk a little bit, uh, I'm not going into too much detail, but you know, science and faith. Uh, so uh, from, a, from us as believers, uh, just a few thoughts on uh, you know, how, uh, science and faith and how we people of Christian faith perceive science, or look, should look at science and some thoughts on that. And we just wanna see what the scriptures say on it. Uh, it's not gonna be a complete thing because we're going to have a little discussion on science and faith. Then we're going to go into the next chapter, which chapter four, where we uh, talk about uh, creation from a scientific perspective. And then at the end of that, we will come back to some additional questions, which will be more specific questions on uh, science and faith. Right, uh, especially in the context of creation. So we're going to talk a little bit on science and faith now. It's not complete because once we do this chapter four on creation from a scientific perspective, then we come back to some more specific questions on um, uh, from a science specific questions from a scientific perspective on asking uh, questions that are commonly asked about creation about why we believe certain things and so on. So uh, that's the approach we're going to take. And then we will get into a little detail on Darwin's theory and then a little detail on Big Bang, just to understand that cosmology and answer some questions, right? So we're kind of going to spend a little bit of time from a scientific perspective. And uh, uh, some of you may enjoy it. Uh, some of you, if if you kind of disconnect and say, "Oh, it's a little too much," don't worry. We will, you know, it's, we will spend a few lectures on it. Then we will get back into other things, like we'll talk about, you know, the scriptures, the Bible, uh, the authenticity of scriptures, and so on. So we're going to spend a few lectures that are 
kind of scientific or science oriented. Uh, if that's not uh, something you're interested in, just you know, just bear with us. Uh, we will get through it. Okay. Um, so uh, let's just begin now with a very uh, basic. Uh, this is a little more of a, a basic uh, discussion here on science and faith. Where is that? Yeah. Okay. Right. Just looking at three of basic three simple questions: uh, science and faith from a from from a Christian perspective. Right? I mean, this thing. Okay. So I'm just sharing my screen here. So. First of all, the, the big question, and uh, we will elaborate on this as we go to the next chapter. Uh, from a Christian perspective, a Christian faith perspective, should we be afraid that science would contradict the Christian faith? Or from a Christian faith perspective, uh, you know, uh, how do we, how should we, and how do we perceive science? You know, uh, uh, it, it is sad, but somehow many people tend to think that if you're a scientist, you can't be a believer. And if you're a believer, you can't be a scientist. You know, if somehow people tend to think like that. But that is not true. Uh, for us as believers or people of Christian faith, uh, people of faith, uh, science is not a contradiction, but rather science is an uh, investigation, and it's an exploration into God's creation. And so we don't feel threatened by science. We are actually excited by science. I mean, we like it. You know, and whatever expression of science, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, a life science, whether we're talking about something that's uh, in the physics realm or, or physics or chemistry, biology, or even whether it's technology and engineering, whatever, you know, whatever particular stream of science somebody may want to look at. As Christians, we are not threatened by it because for us, uh, science is an exploration of God's creation. And, uh, you know, just, just want us to, so even as we go into talking about some of these things, uh, this is how we approach it. Um, it's not, uh, you know, this, this, so this assumption or pre presumption that some people have that um, if you're a believer, you can't be a scientist or you can't be interested in science is not true. Now, some scriptures along this line, Psalm 115, and we'll just go through this fast. I don't want to uh, spend too much time here on this. We'll get into the next chapter. Uh, Psalm 115, verse 16. Somebody can uh, please read that. Uh, I am reading Psalm 115, verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord. But the earth has he given to the children of men. Yeah. So, you know, God is in the heavens. He knows everything there. The earth is entrusted to us. And, uh, and, and so, you know, when we study things here on earth, and now we're even exploring space, that when we study things that have been given to us, uh, we are... You know, we're just exploring things that God has made accessible to us. We're exploring it. We are researching it. We are investigating it. We are, uh, you know, like a, a child that's, you know, uh, left in a room full of toys. Uh, the child doesn't sit there and say, oh, I, I can't touch any toy. You can see the child going around trying to explore all the toys, maybe put their hands in all the toys at the same time, if possible. The child goes to explore, uh, wants to find out, you know, about the toys and how the toys work and what what can be done. And so it's like that, you know, what God has made available to us, accessible to us, we are exploring. I think Isaiah 28 uh, uh, brings that out very beautifully. Isaiah 28, 23 to 29, somebody could read that. 
that uh, what I want to just point out is that even in our exploration of God's creation of things around us, God is actually helping us. God is actually involved in that process. Isaiah 28, 23 to 29, somebody could read that. Isaiah 28, verse 23 onwards. Give ear and hear my voice. Listen and hear my speech. Does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning his soil and breaking the clots? When he has leveled its surface, does he not sow the black cumin and scatter the cumin? Plant the wheat in rows and barley in the appointed place and spelt in its place. For he instructs that him in right judgment, his God teaches him. For the black cumin is not threshed with the threshing sledge, nor is a cartwheel rolled over the cumin. But the black cumin is beaten out with a stick and the cumin with a rod. Bread flour must be ground, therefore he does not thresh it forever. Break it with its cartwheel or crush it with, its, with his horsemen. This also comes from the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance. Amen. So it's kind of an interesting passage here where uh, the prophet Isaiah is asking, you know, hey, um, uh, of course, in those days, farming was what they knew. You know, so he was asking, you know, how does a farmer know what to do? Right? How does a farmer know, yeah, this is how he's got to plow this kind of crop and this is how he has to process this kind of grain. How does a farmer know that? And what Isaiah is pointing out, this is in verse 26 and verse 29, he's saying is, hey, God is teaching or God is instructing or has instructed the farmer uh, in this. So uh, the context here, of course, is farming. If, if Isaiah had to say the same thing in in our day, today, he would probably use science or technology or some, something that's relevant to our day. But the point I want to highlight here is uh, God is in, God himself is involved in our discovery, our process of discovery, and our process of harnessing what has been made, made available to us in creation. So. So when people are, you know, doing scientific research or uh, other kinds of research and study uh, in order to see, you know, how best can we harness this kind of energy or how best can we do this, or how best can we do that? Uh, these are not against God. In fact, God himself is involved in helping us learn how to make the best use of uh, what he has made accessible to us in, in you know, in, we call it creation or nature or in the world. God is involved in um, helping us do that. And so uh, when, when, when people are exploring they, in medicine or in, 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 in certain areas, you know, whether even down to the level of genetics, and that's a big question, we will uh, address you know, some of the ethical issues on genetics in, when we come to um, a later part in, uh, on, on, on social issues. Uh, yes, there are ethical issues, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't go down and explore those things to those levels. You know, explore, understand. Uh, but everything has to be done in a way that benefits people and glorifies God. When we misuse uh, what God has made available to us, then we end up creating destructive things. You know, we end up destroying lives, harming people, doing things we should not be doing. But just because there is the possibility of doing that or it is being done, the wrong things are being done, you know, whether it's in, you know, uh, creating weapons that destroy or so on, doesn't mean we shouldn't explore the possibility of making good use of things. Right. So keep this in mind that when 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 we are uh, studying, researching, and seeking ways to harness things around us, God is also involved in that process, and He wants us to discover and make the best use of what uh, He has made available to us. And not only that, but we had mentioned this earlier in Romans one and verse twenty. Somebody could read that. That uh, at the end, uh, our, our goal is to discover more about God in His own creation. Romans one verse twenty. 
Can I read, sir? Go ahead, please. For since, has, for since the creation of the world, God is invisible qualities. His internal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been, been made so that men are without any excuse. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. So what we are saying is that the invisible attributes of God is revealed to us in creation. So when we are studying creation, studying things that is around us, our desire is to encounter God. Our desire is that, hey, we see God in all of these things. right? So for us, uh, uh, in the study of science, we're expecting to see how great our God is. Uh, it's just going to make us worship our God even more. right? So that's the Christian faith response or perspective concerning science. We are not threatened by it. And therefore, we shouldn't walk away from it. But instead, you know, we should enjoy it. Those of us who like to do that, okay, study, research, because of these reasons. That leads us to another question in science and faith is, you know, what about discoveries made in science? They cannot be explained by biblical accounts or from what we find in scripture. For example, you know, we... And we will talk about this a little later. You know, what about the whole issue of uh, um, uh, uh, dating uh, the uh, materials, whether it's fossils, whether it's archaeological discoveries, other things that they actually go back, way back, uh, beyond, you know, as far as the Bible is concerned, the earth is the earth, or from Genesis uh, one from the creation account. Uh, if you go from there, uh, it's about 6,000 years. Uh, uh, 6,000 some years. Uh, so what when, when we find all this information coming at us that says, you know, this fossil is so many hundreds of thousands of years old uh, or, um, you know, so many different things. You know, the universe is so many billions of years old, so on and so forth, uh, which are scientifically given to us, but which somehow we can't prove or see in scripture, right? Uh, how do we respond to it? How do we reconcile with that kind of information? Now, of course, we will have some things to talk about in detail uh, as far as time and so on is concerned. But what we must keep in mind is the Bible doesn't claim to reveal all knowledge or information about everything. That's not what the Bible is. The Bible is the scriptures given to us to help us know God. And again, it's not everything about God, but what we do know, or what God wants us to know. Right? So we accept that uh, there will be things that we don't have answers for this side of heaven. And we don't have to answer everything. Right? Um, so we look at two scriptures on this in Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. Somebody could read that for us. The secret things belong to the Lord for God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Yeah. So we accept mm -hmm. that there are some things God has kept secret. Secret things belong to God. There are some things that, that you don't find in the pages of the Bible. Uh, and, uh, and there will be information, scientific knowledge or information presented, which it's very hard to reconcile uh, with what we find written for us in Scripture. But then we also know the Bible is not claiming that this is complete knowledge, that the, the pages of the Bible is a repository of all knowledge there is. That's not true. The Bible doesn't claim that. And uh, the Bible does state here, as we see in Deuteronomy 29, 29, that there are things that are hidden, that are secret, which only God knows. But what has been revealed is for us to walk by. So the Bible is God's book, God's word given to us to how to live life in the fear of God and how he wants us to walk here on earth. Right? So we're not going to try to answer everything. 
and we accept that there will be information that is not necessarily addressed, that is not addressed within the pages of scripture. And another instruction Paul gave to Timothy, this is in 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, we are not afraid of science, but uh, 1 Timothy 6, 20 and 21, um, some of, somebody could read that, please. Okay, I'll read. Please go ahead. Okay, First Timothy uh, 6, 20, 21. Oh, Timothy, God, God, the deposit entrusted it to you. Avoid the irrelevant bubble and contra contradictions of what is falsely, falsely known or called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Thank you Pastor. So, thank you. So, Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, you protect what's been given to you. And don't get into idle talk, empty, you know, empty talk, and don't get into contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. In some versions, it's translated falsely called science. Because some people, having gotten into it, have strayed from the faith. So what is our resp response to things where people, you know, present to us saying, hey, how can you explain this from the Bible? And we say, yeah, we accept the Bible is not a complete repository of all information. And we are going to protect what has been committed to us, right? So as far as we are concerned, look, we are convinced about our faith, what we believe, we're going to protect it. And I'm not going to necessarily try to answer, or try to address everything that is presented to us. And uh, Paul has said, you know, some, uh, in an attempt to try to engage with that, they've just strayed from the faith, right? So we don't want to do that, right? We, we believe, we protect what has been given to us. And we accept that there are things we may not have answers for. And God is not expecting us to have answers for everything. Okay. And one last thought here, and I'll just open it up for some discussion before we go to the next chapter, is that we must understand that even in science, there are things that are truly a leap of faith. Right? So, even in science, we have laws and we have theories. Theories, not all scientific theories are eventually proven. You know, now that's the scientific process. You postulate something, you have presented theory, or and then you try to research it further and further, and eventually you can prove it or disprove it. But until a theory has been proven, it's still theory. Right? It doesn't translate into a, a scientific fact. And uh, so many things that are put forward uh, are still theories. And for, for, for somebody to be fully convinced about a theory without having proven it, then that aspect, I'm not saying every aspect of science, but that aspect of science, to believe a theory without having it proved, being proven is actually taking a leap of faith, right? So to that extent, uh, in science, there is a leap of faith when people believe theories. Now, we're not against theories because that's how the scientific process works. You start off with a theory and then you research it and then you either prove it or disprove it. Or if you cannot do it either way, it just stays a theory. But to believe in a theory, even when it has not been proven or disproven uh, completely, is a leap of faith. So to that extent, we understand uh, science calls for a leap of faith. And uh, if you ask the scientists, uh, in their mind, actually, they feel very strongly about a theory, and that's why they pursue it. Uh, and, and either to you know, find that that is true or maybe that's not true. 
or theories can be then subsequently overridden by other theories. So there is this actually in science, there is an element of faith. There's a leap of faith uh, that scientists would be involved in. Um, so just ha having uh, addressed that, uh, we are going to come back to additional questions, more specific scientific questions on creation and so on after we go through the next chapter. But I want to pause here and just um, see if um, anybody has questions or comments on just, you know, uh, this whole issue on science and faith, you know, a, a believer's, a, Christ, a, um, a person of Christian faith, how should he look at science? Uh, uh, just on that issue, if you have questions or comments, we can take it up and then we will proceed into the next chapter. Right, let me look at the let me look at the chat. Okay, um, Charles, do you have a question? Yes, I do. What is leap of faith? Um, okay, uh, a, a, a leap of faith is just a phrase um, that we say it's a step of faith. You know, it's, it's something that you believe, um, just like how we have faith, you know, uh, in God, in his word. Um, so that's what we're talking about. A leap of faith is just a phrase to say that somebody believes something. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so any other questions here on just, you know, uh, the Christian's perspective, uh, you know, a, a Christian faith perspective on science? Uh, uh, any questions on that? Right. So I see Rose's comment there. Um, uh, that's true, right? So in science, you start off with something, with an hypothesis, and then you research. Maybe it's, it works out right, maybe it doesn't. Um, yeah. Anything else? Any other comments or questions? Okay, uh, we will understand. Okay, so I see Samuel's comment. Okay, questions on time, evolution, we can discuss it after we go to the next chapter. Anything else? All right. So for just to quickly recap what we did here in chapter three uh, is just as, a, as an introduction, it's not necessarily a complete um, discussion uh, about science and faith. What we said was, um, first of all, as people of Christian faith, we are not, and I'm just reviewing for the benefit of those who got in just now, uh, what we're saying, number one, or what we said, number one, is as people of Christian faith, we are not averse to science or the scientific process or scientific information. And we are not threatened by it. In fact, those of us of the Christian faith, uh, we are excited about science simply because we, for us, we look at science as uh, exploring, number one, it's an exploration into what God has made available to us. Secondly, we see that God himself is engaged with us uh, in our process of investigation of creation to help us know how to put it to good use. They know how to do things with it. We see God is involved in that. And thirdly, we see it as an opportunity for us to encounter the greatness of God because um, the Bible says the invisible attributes of God are revealed to us in his creation. So if you're studying his creation, it only going to, it's only going to make us marvel more and more about how great our God is, right? So that is the Christian faith perspective on science. So that we keep in mind. The next thing we said is that... Uh, we are not threatened when we have scientific information or knowledge given to us 
uh, which the Bible doesn't address because we know that the Bible is not a complete repository of all information or knowledge. The Bible doesn't claim that. In fact, the Bible tells us that there are secret things uh, that um, that belong to God and that he is not going to, uh, that there are things that he will not disclose to us, but the things that he has made available, that he has revealed is for us to live by. Right? So Bible has already mentioned that. And so we are going, we understand that. So therefore we are not under any pressure to try to explain all the information and everything that is given to us through science. We're not under any pressure to do that. And we're also going to guard ourselves, First Timothy 6, 20, 21. We're also going to guard ourselves and not unnecessarily get involved in things that don't matter and be careful not to let those things lead us astray. Okay. And then the third thing we said is that, uh, the third thing we said is that um, even in the scientific process, we understand that there is, an element of faith, right? That um, uh, especially uh, when people subscribe to theories, they are believing something, you know, and then they work on it. So there is that, you know, aspect of believing certain theory, or believing something. So there is that element there, even in the scientific process. Okay, so this is what we said, and we will pick up additional questions. Uh, for, uh, specific questions in science and creation and so on as we go along. Okay, um, I'll just quickly respond to the questions here. Um, um, Prabhakar has asked, Amos 3, 7, God reveals to his servants so we can know the secret which is not made available in Bible. Um, Prabhakar, yeah, so Amos chapter 3, verse 7, is talking about God who speaks to his prophets, but God doesn't give the prophet all information. Right, in the prophetic, in the prophetic, God gives us a piece of information, a little bit of information. God is all knowing; He knows everything, but He gives us a little information. Even to the prophet, the prophet doesn't know everything. All right, He gives a piece of information, and um, and so we work with the piece of information He gives to us. That's it. So prof prophetic is not knowing everything that God knows. Prophetic. Prophetic is knowing a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. Now, that means you're getting a little piece of information from God, uh, whatever it might be, you know, whether it's concerning an individual, concerning something God wants you to do, so on and so forth. But it's not that God is giving all information because um, he knows everything. Okay. Um, Abraham, uh, is it okay to have faith in science? Now, uh, let me answer the question. The answer is yes, in the sense that to whatever science presents to us as a fact, we understand it and we take it. But that does not mean that we have greater faith in science than in God, right? There's a big difference between uh, scientific information and God. Right. Scientific information is valid to the extent that uh, you know you can it, it's been researched well and you can understand it to that extent. But we know that that information can be improved. That information can change because it is us humans investigating something, learning about something. So to that extent, we understand it and we use it and we rely on it. We don't trust in science more than trusting in God because God is unchangeable. He is the father of lights. There is no turning. So our reliance on the word of God and our reliance on God is at a much higher level than our reliance on scientific information because we know there are limitations. Uh, some of it may be very well researched and established laws. Okay, that we rely on. Some of it may be information that could change as we go along, as we learn more. So we accommodate that because we know 
uh, the science is a process of investigation and research. And uh, as we learn, uh, you know, our understanding becomes better. So that's our, that's how we handle scientific information. There's nothing wrong in relying on it or making good use of it or trusting in it. I mean, that's the reason we get into an airplane. Why? Remember, you get into an airplane, uh, we don't think of it, but the fact is, uh, uh, you know, we expect all the laws uh, uh, of aerodynamics to work. And we go from place A to place B. We don't expect the pilot to come on the announcement and say, guys, today, sorry, um, the wind is, you know, wind is not doing what it's supposed to do. Gravity is not doing what it's supposed to do. We can't fly. We don't expect that. No. But to that extent, we know that, that the laws of aerodynamics work and we actually rely on it to go from place A to place B, and like that, there's so many things. And that's perfectly fine, okay? All right, uh, Abraham has a question. Uh, uh, please, how do we use this verse in 1 Corinthians 2, 5? Yeah, so Paul says, you know, that uh, my preaching and my teaching was not, was not with excellency of man's wisdom, that your faith should not rest uh, in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God, First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 5, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, right? So the context of verse 5 is verse 4, um, right? What is the verse 4 saying? He's saying, uh, when he talks about the wisdom of men there in verse 5, he's talking about great presentation, human wisdom, right? With persuasive words of human wisdom. Right. So he's saying we don't put our trust or our dependence on persuasive words of human wisdom to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? That's not our dependence. Our dependence is on the power of God. Okay. So First Corinthians two five is not a, a discussion about scientific information and yeah. You know, faith in God, but he's talking about, you know, that when we preach and teach the word of God, we are not depending on our eloquence, our oratory skills, or how well we can present. He's talking about depending on the power of the Spirit of God. That's what we are depending on. And so that people will place their faith in God, in the power of God, rather than in our presentation skills. So that's First Corinthians 2, 4, and 5. Okay. Um, so we, uh, we shouldn't kind of use it to just exclude or do away with scientific information. Uh, we make use of it. And like I said, to a certain extent, we're not trusting in it as much as we trust in God. We use it, of course, in our day-to-day -day lives. Is that it? okay, Abraham, or do you have follow-up question? Thank you, Pastor. I, I was just thinking uh, uh, with the fact that maybe um, I used to practice this a lot. Maybe like I have a, maybe an iron uh, which is not working. And instead of taking it to maybe the electrician to fix it, I just try to lay my hands on it so that I, I could pray so that it can work. So I was looking at the case where Jesus spoke to trees, Jesus spoke to food. So in that context, um, Believing in science means that I know that this is not working. I should directly take it to the electrician. But here is the case that I want to apply faith. So that is what I'm trying to balance, whether it's a good thing to apply faith, knowing that science can solve the issue. Mm. And then looking at it also in the context of Jesus, where he knew that, I mean, he could at least go and buy food or could look for another means to get food, but yet he prayed to multiply the food. So I'm trying to balance the two so that I'll be sure of what I'm doing personally. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing that, Abraham. Uh, and, and, I, and, and here's how I look at it. And, I, and we will take up the other questions from Christopher and Prabhaka. Here's the way I look at it, Abraham. There is, there is our faith in God. There is the knowledge that we have with scientific or engineering, whatever, that the natural knowledge we have. And then there is stewardship. That means responsibility, the way God wants us to live. 
So in the case of the example I used, you know, an iron the ironing box doesn't work, the computer doesn't work, or the internet doesn't work, or or you know, there's so many other things in life. Yes, our faith in God can influence the, the natural. And there will be times we will do that. But there is also this issue of stewardship where God says you take care of it. That means I'm, I'm responsible. So if I, if I have a car, I do send my car for servicing. Not that I can't pray over the car. Of course, when I pray, I know I bless my car, but I do send the car for servicing. That is stewardship. That means you're taking care of your car, your vehicle, or whatever it is, you know, that you do take care of it. Or as we see in scripture, there are Jesus multiplying food. Now, we don't know how many times Jesus multiplied food. We know two are recorded for us. But we also know that there are other times Jesus went to people's house and they made him food. So we know when he went to Mary and Martha, Martha was busy, right? Cooking food, getting things ready. Jesus didn't say, Martha, come and sit down. After I give you my sermon, I'm going to pray and food will appear in your kitchen. It didn't happen that way. You know, or when he went to the house of Simon or other people's homes that we have recorded, you know, he sat at meal and they served. He didn't multiply food. Somebody had to work, do the hard work of making that food. So, but it is not like Jesus multiplied food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day for 33 years. No, there are times when faith overrode the, nat overrode the natural, but the other times there was stewardship that engaged or made use of the natural. So as a believer, in handling the natural, I understand there is stewardship. I also understand there is the supernatural. There are times God would want me to use my faith to cause the supernatural to happen. But most of the time, God wants me to operate out of stewardship in handling the natural. So there's nothing wrong in you know, servicing an equipment or whatever. It's, it's just being a good steward of it. Is that OK, Abraham? Yes, Pastor. Yes, Pastor. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. All right, we have um, a question from Christopher, please. Uh, yes, Pastor. So I, I want to just to sort of you know look at uh, you, know, uh, you know science and uh, and religion, you know, in in two sort of uh, you know, so, uh, two, two streams where um, they both have uh, you know um, been. Uh, I mean, are there basically and, and have you know evolved, you know, for the common good of man and you know, to, in the in the case of science, you know, uh, there were uh, uh, inventions and uh, you know making making the life of people uh, much better, and um, in in the case of religion, you know, people have have uh, have done great things and uh, have uh, you know um, aspired to you know. Uh, be um, be be holy and uh, you know basically governed by 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 the, by the tenets of uh, of religion but on the flip side there is also this this uh, this aspect of you know science having been um been used you know for um, for wrong purposes and mm -hmm. um, there have been i mean uh, you know cases of you know where you know weapons have been created and uh, you know nuclear arms and you know now we have we have reached stage where you know we can add a press of a button we can you know destroy uh, you know half the world a quarter of the world or whatever you know at the at the, at the press of a button and similarly in in the case of religion uh, religion has also been misused um, uh, in in certain aspects so i guess my question is is about um, you know where uh, at the current time where um, religion is is has also uh, uh, you know uh, is is very much there, but you know 
man has also fallen uh, you know um, in spite of religion and uh, in a in a similar way uh, you know science is also uh, you know gone gone in a sense uh, astray so uh, i i'm i'm not sure if i'm you know framing the question uh, properly but i think we are reaching a stage where the, um, there is um, ability to you know to in a sense end the world um uh, and and the world will will come to an end uh in in both in in both these streams so uh, i think for you know from if I, if i were to put the science cap on my head right now i would say that you know we, we, we you know where have where have each each of these two streams taken us you know um because you know there is uh, it's 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 not you know it is it is uh, you know result it is it can result in something that is you know that brings brings an end to the world so uh, I, i'm not trying to i'm not trying to bring a, a pessimistic view it's more of a question of you know uh, how the how these two streams have uh, have evolved and uh, you know reach the stage um, where they, where they are currently at mm. yeah yeah so that is true christopher um that both uh, you know science and faith uh, have done a lot of good for people uh, and yet there has also there is also like you pointed out the flip side of it where there's a lot of harm being done uh, in both sides and uh, uh, just a side note when we read through the book of revelation the two big things that happened before the coming of christ that is the that's revelation 19 and when i say the coming of christ i'm not talking about the rapture but i'm talking about the second coming when he comes to establish his kingdom on the earth revelation 19 there are two things that happen major things that happen revelation 17 talks about an economic system people around the world subscribe to but that collapses sorry revelation 17 talks about uh, mystery babylon it talks about uh, a, a global we can call it a global religious system and revelation 18 talks about an economic system so i, I know it's not science but the economic economy is driven by science and technology so two things that collapse before revelation 19 a religious system a global religious system that is something that everybody subscribes to so i'm not talking necessarily saying people have used the term one world religion it may or may not be a single religion but it's a global religious system something that everybody subscribes to so that collapses what people have faith in and a global economic system revelation 18 collapses which people around the world have put their trust in so i feel, i just you know see that look these two things are going to collapse that people have put a faith in before revelation 19 before the heavens open and jesus comes riding on the white horse um the battle of armageddon takes place and so on just a observation okay All right one last question and then we will uh, wrap up this session uh, prabhakar uh, is science influenced by the devil uh, because even after exploring some don't believe or is it because people don't want to admit that there is a creator uh, so like we said uh, um, prabhakar science really is is a, a neutral investigative process it then it depends on the people who are involved in it so you have both sides in Isaiah 28 that be the passage we read verses 23 to 26 we see that god is involved in that process helping us learn how to use uh, and harness his creation but romans chapter 1 verse 20 to 23 is the other side where people they're looking at creation but they're choosing not to see the creator so both god and the devil and the depraved human mind are at work god for those who are willing to listen and you know god is helping us understand his creation and make good use of it 
But at the same time, man, as he engages with creation, according to Romans 1, 20 to 23, is choosing not to see the creator. He's choosing, he becomes you know, corrupt in his mind. He's choosing, he's refusing to see the creator, although the invisible attributes of God are seen in creation. And then, of course, yes, the devil will also instigate people to take the you know, things that are there and use it for destruction, use it for wrong purposes, unethical uses, and so on. So that's also there, right? So creation is, it's, it's of course, from God. But as we investigate, we understand there is all of these things at work. Okay? All right. So we'll wrap up this uh, discussion here on science and faith. I mean, if somebody has any further questions, you can do present it after the break, or what we will do um, uh, after the break, we will get into the next chapter. We talk about creation from a science scientific perspective. You know, how, how can, uh, uh, from a science perspective, say that, you know, look, these are simple things that are telling us that there is a creator, right? So we're going to look at that. And, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, we will take that up as well. Okay. So let's go for a quick break. Thank you for engaging in discussion. It is good taking your questions. We'll take a quick 10 minute break and be back, please. Thank you.